Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Ryan Robinson. Ryan's the founder and blogger at BryRob.com, which has a shitload of readers, 500,000 plus, I believe, and subscribers. It used to be 150,000, but now it's 105,000, which we talked about in this episode. <laughs> why, why the reduction? Uh, Ryan and I have known each other digitally for many years, but this was our first actual conversation, and we clicked right away. Lots of similar interests and experiences. We covered some of these in the conversation, like how Ryan built a network and personal brand through his job at Creative Live that then fed his freelancing and then later his business. We also covered tactical stuff like how to choose keywords and topics, how to write and work with freelancers and when to write your own stuff, why link building is absolutely still effective and some ways to do it. And uh, finally, we talk about ideas like perfectionism, work-life balance, and um, habits, and and not taking yourself too seriously. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Ryan Robinson. Um, Are you stoked for Dune, the movie? Who yeah, you see this back here? Yeah, um, I just read it actually for the first time last year. Oh, it's amazing. It's an incredible book. Like that, that book I feel like has transformed the way in which I look at life, even in some ways. And how, how so? It came to me at the time that let's say like maybe a year and a half ago, a time that I started doing therapy for the first time in my life. And I kind of like As I was reading Dune, I was normalizing a lot of the feelings that I was having around like a relationship. So I had essentially, I called off a wedding with who was my fiance at the time. And we eventually broke up later that year, but lots of just kind of like inner turmoil stuff that I hadn't unpacked for myself. And Dune was like this companion reading of like this, this kid who's got kind of an inner awakening going on and for me, I just really resonated with that experience for myself and yeah, tuning into things about myself that I hadn't otherwise listened to before, which was really empowering. It's interesting because I feel like in some ways Dune is the classic hero's journey. It's it's a lot yeah. of the same tropes that you see in many like fantasy and sci-fi movies today. But for some reason I felt I felt like it was similarly, like it was deeper than a lot of the other things that I've read or like watched in that. Did you feel the same? And I guess like why? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the deepest books I'd say I've ever read. Um, and maybe some of that is because it came to me at this juncture point the in my life. Time. It was the perfect time for sure. I don't think I would have been as open or receptive even to some of the messages and undercurrents of the book. But yeah, like gives me a ton of respect too for the author, Frank Herbert, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. The way that he's like the depth that he weaves into characters is just unbelievable. And I don't know. I just found something magical to it for myself. I'm on book like six right now, I think. Oh, I didn't even realize that there was like that many more books. Honestly, I remember there being (laughs) sequels, but I was like, all right, I'm going to check back in because the the first one took me a long time to get through. It was like a slow read for me, you know, so you would recommend continuing on. I got it in the heart or the paperback here. And then like. It was such a slog for the first hundred pages, and because there's like I the language, to get it right? On the there's it's it like it takes a while to like learn the language and like all the different tropes and like specific things in that universe. But once you're in it, it's like makes total sense. Yeah, places, people's names, even like there's so much that feels foreign about it. But I, I eventually kind of just gave myself permission to be like, eh, fuck it, I'm not gonna know this person very well. And over time, like. It builds and you do get to understand those people. But yeah, like releasing attachment to to knowing everything like as it's happening was was useful for me. And honestly, getting it on Kindle made the biggest difference in the world because it's it's such a huge, hefty book that it just felt so much more approachable on Kindle. I don't know. Some some mm-hmm. magic to that. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna have to check out the, the sequels in the next couple of books there. Um Let's let's start the conversation back at like uh, the highest level. I, I want to go into the stuff you were talking about with work life balance and kind of like how work fits into your life, and you know you don't define yourself by you know the ups and downs. But at a high level, what does a day in the life look for you right now? Like, what do you how do you describe what you do in terms of like your your career and your um, your work? 
Uh, maybe this is a theme, but I am in a state of transition. Actually, mm. I've thought of myself for several years as a blogger, and I'm kind of emerging into this space now where I'm realizing I'm much more of a CEO. So I'm not writing on a daily basis. I still enjoy writing from time to time, but I only do it when I feel like pulled into it versus sitting down and feeling like, oh shit, I got to write a thousand words today. Um, Cause I've given myself the permission to be like, you know, my business isn't going to fail tomorrow. It's not going to fail in six months. It's not going to fail in years. If I don't publish an article this week, that's okay. I'll get to it next week. Um, and so, yeah, like giving myself permission to, to also outsource things and be okay with me not needing to have control over everything and be the person who perfects everything. You're, if you're picking up on lots of like threads of perfectionism here, that was, that was drilled into me as a kid. And so I'm constantly unwinding that stuff. But today, CEO, much more than just a blogger. Mm. So transition wise, um, you went from working like a typical nine to five or like, what, what did you do before um, your current business that you're running? I started out as a content marketer. So very similar worlds that we exist in. And I was working, living and working in San Francisco, worked with a bunch of different startups, some ed tech stuff, Creative Live, I think was probably the biggest one I worked with hmm. and got to meet an amazing amount of cool people there. Like Tim Ferriss came through, Richard Branson, lots of really cool, inspirational people came through and taught classes. And so I had the fortune of working directly on what was called the money and life channel. Mm -hmm. And most of the content was about business. So for me, my job was literally like writing blog posts about these classes that were about business. And I personally found it interesting. I got to make time for watching these classes and putting stuff into action on my blog alongside all of this while it was going on. And yeah, like lots of just really harmonious stuff went on for several years while I was working at different tech startups and essentially got to build my own brand by doing lots of things like guest posting for other websites in order to you know promote a class on Creative Live. And at the same time, I was getting my name published on different websites in this niche that I was personally interested in. And yeah, from there began doing freelance work, um, more and more clients just kind of reaching out, asking if I could do similar things to what I was doing for Creative Live and what I had on my own blog at the time. And it just kind of organically became a side freelance business that was earning more than my day job. And so I switched over to doing that full time for about two years or so before, before my blog eventually overcame that too, which is kind of a really cool uh, lesson to learn is that if you if I at least give things the space to grow, then focusing on the ones that I do want to grow is kind of my trajectory for finding what comes next for me. Yeah. If, if you water the garden, the, the plants will grow. So were, yeah. you were doing freelance right writing garden. or what was the, yeah, the right garden for sure. And the next garden, that's the, you know, kind of like you're planting seeds for the next stage of your life. So it was freelance writing that you were doing when you were at Creative Live or what was the freelance? Yeah. Freelance content marketing, freelance writing. I think hilariously enough, if you Google search like freelance content marketer or something, I still have a page on my site that comes up in the first or second result, even though oh, I don't no way. really, I don't really invest in that anymore. But that alone, like that tactic brought me, I mean, tons of, of leads and several clients, like one that became a, a $10,000 a month retainer for about two years, just Google search freelance content marketer landed on my page and sent me an email. So how did you get just that the page things. ranking? <laughs> I think the short answer is, you know, always combination of on-page and off-page SEO related stuff. Um, I think there's a different conversation about ranking the page and getting the page to be high converting for the mm -hmm. right people. But the ranking stuff, um, I think getting the best practices down right and then just essentially doing lots of guest blogging where I could link to that post in my bio, or if I'm talking about writing and marketing related stuff and these guest posts I'm writing, tastefully linking back to that if those sites allow me to. Um, slow grind, not something that happens overnight. Yeah. 
So at Creative Live, um, it sounds like a big piece of this in terms of the value was the networking and the uh, the learning that you got to do from people like Tim Ferriss and Richard Branson. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, were you in office? Did you um, did you build a, a lasting network from that? Or like, how, how did that look, that aspect of the job? It's really weird to think about in office times right now as we're recording this in our bedrooms, living rooms, offices at home. But yeah, that was one of the the magical things about being at Creative Live was that it was a really open space, very collaborative. Um, however you feel about open office plans, I enjoyed it at the time. Um, interruptions, yeah, sometimes happened, but also just lots of like really good connection with people and several people that I still keep in touch with today and even several instructors. Yeah. Like I've, I've emailed with, worked with, like reviewed books from a dozen people that came through Creative Live and taught classes while I was there. And it was really cool to just be able to like see what was being recorded live that day in the San Francisco office and then like pop in and be an audience member for an hour or something. And yeah, always good, good opportunities to just meet interesting people and have interesting conversations with them. And, you know, some, sometimes you or I wouldn't necessarily click with those people. I think of someone like Neil Patel, when he came through as a specific example, um, you know, he's got this online persona and you, you see videos of him all the time. And when I, not to shit on him, but when I talk to him in person, like, he just didn't seem like terribly interested in anyone else. He kind of showed up and was like, I'm here to do a keynote speech for 90 minutes and, you know, peace out. So just because those people are in the building, it isn't a guarantee that you're going to have, you know, some sort of meaningful connection or opportunity with them, but lots of cool stuff did happen as a result of being there. Yeah. The Neil Patel anecdote doesn't shock me. Um, so it actually, let me know if any of this resonates with you, but your situation is is so, um, it's, it's so resonates with my experience when I was at CXL because I was, I was writing and doing growth marketing. I was working with an, an iconoclast, uh, you know, Pep Laya. It sounds like <laughs> Chase Jarvis is similar, right? He's a strongly opinionated, influential person who's influencing a certain part of the industry. Um, you're surrounded by interesting, smart people who are like big names in that space. Similarly, like at CXL, we ran conferences and went to a ton of them. So I, you know, got to hobnob with all the, the best experimentation people. And through my work, I I built my own brand, right? Like I was writing on the blog, I was doing all these guest posts and like inadvertently got paid to learn shit. And I, I got paid to um, build a personal brand. It sounds like it was, it was pretty similar for you. I mean, literally the exact same story, just swap out some of the details and, and geographic locations. <laughs> I, I really can't imagine like a more perfect scenario for someone who wants to be a creator than to get a job at a company that's in a space you're interested in building your brand around. And yeah, you're essentially, you're paid to learn. You're paid to promote the product or the service, whatever you're working with. And at the same time, you just can't help but spread your own name and your message while you're doing it. It's the perfect thing ever. Right. So in terms of what you do now, you mentioned you run your own business. It's a blog, ryrob.com. Can you explain a little bit of um, how that got started? And then do you monetize via um, you know, courses, affiliate? What does the What does the business look like right now? Yeah, there's... There's such a funny evolution to it that I think tracks closely with my own growth and changes I've gone through over time. But the site actually in, in January of 2022 is going to be 10 years old, which is wild um, to see all the different evolutions it's had. But it, it really began as me kind of just documenting my own experiences. I had a, a business in college, a product I made called the iStash that was a, an iPhone lookalike, you know, hide your anything device designed to fit things like lighters and cigarette shaped objects uh, <laughs> to take into concerts and music festivals and whatnot. Um, I remember those days. Those were good times, man. <laughs> I hope they come back. But yeah, my, my blog really began just as a place where I was documenting mostly fuck ups, if I'm being honest. Um, I hadn't succeeded by, by, traditional definitions at a business at the time. And people would always ask me questions about how to develop a product, how to sell things online, even though like I didn't feel particularly successful at it. I 
showed them the things that did work. And I talked about the things that didn't and what I would do differently moving forward. And so that kind of became the through line for my blog. I think even to today is just documenting my process, what works, what doesn't, everything in between. Um, but it it became largely about freelancing when I was freelancing full time. So sharing things like templates and tips, tutorials, resources, um, getting a little bit into the monetization. At that point in time, it was really service based. Like I was mm -hmm. just selling my freelance services and eventually enough people were downloading my free stuff that I asked a few of them, like, what kinds of problems do you have? And eventually did like a proposal writing course and some contract writing courses and just little mini digital products that I could begin to monetize in a more scalable way. And yeah, that, that kind of just naturally took me to getting a, a couple hundred thousand readers a month, I would say. And then more and more people began asking me like, okay, how do you get traffic? How do you monetize an audience? And so I, today, if you look at my site, it's essentially blogging about blogging, pretty right. fucking meta. Um, and courses, affiliate revenue, um, those are the two main channels. Occasionally some things like sponsorships. Um, but yeah, I, I like to keep it simple because I get too distracted if I'm, I'm trying to do too many things at once. Yeah, it's it sounds like you didn't have a strong like strategy or, or I don't want to say you didn't have a vision for this moving in uh, when you when you launched it, but it was like you were just documenting things. It doesn't sound like there was a big focus on like, all right, how is this going to pick up traction? How is this going to get you know ranked in search? How how am I going to monetize this? It seems like that came after and largely as a byproduct of customer feedback or reader feedback. Yeah, very organic and. And it makes me think of something I was I was uh, that came to my mind while I was meditating this morning. Um, a really good meditation I was doing that made me realize that I sometimes take myself too seriously. And I think one really important lesson for me is that the moments in which I'm not taking myself seriously, when I don't have intense attachment to specific outcomes, um, those are the moments in which I do my best work. And I think my blog is a reflection of allowing myself to, when you zoom out enough, just be really organic about where it goes in listening to other people as, as well as kind of my own internal compass on having some sincerity around what I would like to do and where I would like to see it go. But not that kind of like ultra serious attachment to specific outcomes so much. Does that taking yourself too seriously, does that come with uh, overthinking in many situations as well? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This this looks like something you can resonate with. Well, yeah, for sure. So I think I was going to say, it's, I think it's certain personality types that need to do this the way you're describing it. Um, you know, maybe some people cater towards the opposite side where they need a little bit more structure. But for me, when I get in my own head and start overthinking and taking myself too seriously, that's when I stunt my own growth. And it's like, all right, just let go. You know how to do this, have the confidence to wing it. And then, you know, I feel like this flow state. But I, I do think maybe there are people with that opposite problem where they're like, All right, I actually do need to overthink this and I actually do need a plan here. Um, but it, it's, it seems like we're on the same page with regards to like our hangups, with regards to perfectionism, overthinking, um, you know, all of these, like taking yourself too seriously, those types of problems. Yeah. Yeah. The rigidity thing. That's something that I'll probably forever be working to unroll with myself and in my own life is just not having to have like strict adherence to things like a schedule when it doesn't need to be a super scheduled regimented day, things like that. Like identifying those, those opportunities to be flexible and to have fun in the present. And yeah, there's times when you obviously have to care. Um, but for someone like myself, I have to like really push myself to, to be less serious. Can you tell me more about that or like how you're approaching that? Uh, maybe things you've done tactically in your life to, you know, introduce more frivolity, um, less seriousness. Yeah. Yeah. I think one really specific thing is that for, oh man, the better part of the last decade, essentially my entire professional career, let's call it. Um, I've been such a strict adherent to calendars and mm -hmm to the inbox zero life too. Um, and I think like one really unfortunate byproduct for someone who's very, who's working on being less rigid and less structured um, for me is that 
I can like sometimes feel like I'm failing if my inbox is piling up in a way that feels, you know, out of my control or if my schedule has too many things on it, I'll feel overwhelmed at times. Um, and so, yeah, like learning to, to not need to have blocks of everything on my calendar, like making, making time for something like just writing. Um, I, I like to now approach that much more organically. Like if it's a day that I wake up and I feel like writing, then I write. Um, and some of this speaks to the specific position I'm able to be in right now with working for myself. And I think there's seasonality and phases to all these things, but yeah, not, not forcing myself to do things on a schedule when in reality, it just doesn't really need to happen at this exact hour of the day. Yeah. That, so you you touched on a point that I was actually going to bring up, which is, um, the ability to do this because you've carved out your own career path and you're working on your own thing. Cause I, I, you know, struggle with this. I've got a day job and I also run the agency. Um, with the agency, I can pretty much, you know, control my own schedule. I have to schedule things like this. Uh, we have to put it on the calendar uh, because we both need to meet at the same place in time. Same with sales calls, but it's out, it's out of that. It's like, if I want to write, I don't need to sit down and like write at the same time every day. I can, you know, kind of like let inspiration strike, which I know is like not the best advice I feel like that writers give, but <laughs> whatever. It's um, not even the advice that I give all the time either. I think it's, everything's highly contextual, you know, and there's different phases too. The, the phases thing is interesting. So are you familiar with um, like Mark Andreessen and his, he's got this old article on productivity porn. Does this ring any bells? Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is old school. So like he he talked about how he um, tries to optimize for like flow and therefore he doesn't schedule anything. Like literally there's nothing on his calendar. This is when he was in like builder mode. And he's recently done an interview walking that back entirely where every single chunk of his day is planned out on a calendar because he's got more external focuses. He's basically like he startups that they're investing in are relying on him, right? So he talks about this in phases. And I think Arnold Schwarzenegger also was the type where he wouldn't take a meeting. If you wanted to meet with him, you would have to call him at that moment. And if he wanted to at that moment, he would meet with you, but otherwise you couldn't book anything <laughs> on his calendar. And there's, there's a part of me that deep down really wants that life. Like that sounds fucking awesome to me where <laughs> it's like, all right, it's Tuesday, nothing on the schedule. What do I want to work on? Like just a blank slate of a day. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I do actually, I, I'm fortunate enough to have some days that are like that in which I'll have literally nothing on my calendar and I get to decide in the moment what I allocate my time towards based on like what I feel drawn towards or what, what my energy is like for the day. And sometimes honestly, the answer is don't fucking work today. Like this needs to be, this needs to be a personal day. There's nothing that has to happen. Like the train isn't falling off the tracks if I don't show up and do something. But I think I'm in kind of this hybrid phase right now where as I'm moving towards thinking of myself as more of a CEO of mm. my business and and not the blogger, not the like task manager of everything. Um, I now also have other people that are doing things for me and helping keep the train on the tracks. And so I do have to prioritize, you know, responding to emails from a few select people that have urgent questions for me and making sure that I approve things on time to go live or um, essentially be mindful about empowering the people who are trying to help me. Um, that's kind of the the interesting space I navigate these days. It sounds like you've got some sort of a mental model or a structure to this though. Um, I know there's the Paul Graham essay on like the maker versus manager schedule. So it sounds like you're carving out time for both of those time periods right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, <laughs> in trying to support my personal growth, it's not a process I've strictly documented as I'm pushing back against like having those kinds of rigid things in my life these days. But yeah, I'm somewhere in between these days. And some days do feel like maker days and some days feel like, holy shit, I'm replying to 50 emails and approving tasks and teamwork. And, oh, I got to record a video in between all this. So there isn't a perfect balance. 
Have you carved it out in a way where you know which days of the week are going to be, you know, management days where you're going to be taking meetings, doing podcasts, doing emails, and which days are going to be more free flowing, more blank slate? Do you have like a, you know, Tuesday is meeting day or Friday is like free flow day or like, do you have any, any structure like that? I have things I like, <laughs> things I prefer. It's not always how it eventually manifests itself, but usually Mondays and Fridays are no call days for me. And I like for those to be kind of the maker, the creator days. Um, but, you know, listening to my my body, my mind, um, if I got a terrible night of sleep or if I have something else on my mind, sometimes those aren't going to be the most creative days for me. So I will kick over to being a manager. But if I can not put my head in my inbox for at least the first half of the day on Monday and Friday, that's a huge win for me. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a mix there, but I like the fluidity because you can't always predict what's going to come up, right? Like if you have a rigid routine and something goes wrong, suddenly you feel extra guilty because you can't get the work done that you'd plan that day. But at the same time, um, personally for me, I like to um, try to carve those days out. Back when I was at HubSpot, I used to do no meeting Fridays, um, you know, because of the presupposition that I was doing deep work. Um, now, sometimes I would, sometimes I would get like a month's work of work done, but sometimes I was super tired and I wouldn't do anything. I would just go on long walks. <clears throat> and I didn't talk about that, obviously, within the context of my company. But I mean, in the end, it was more valuable to them because I was getting more work done net um, because I carved those days out. Now it's a little difficult. So I do what's called sacred Saturdays. So basically, Ooh. I wake up and have no plans. Um, some days I'll read for three hours. Some days I, you know, wake up and watch Netflix. Some days I'll just work a ton and I'll actually get a ton of stuff done. But it gives myself kind of that freedom and flexibility to. I, I like the phrase you said, like listen to your body, um, kind of go with the natural rhythms uh, that that um, you're you're responding to, like your natural rhythms versus like trying to you know force a square peg in a round hole and, and do work that you're not naturally set up for that day. Yeah. Today is actually the perfect example for me. I <laughs> we were talking about Dune earlier. I was uh I was up reading Dune until like 11:30 last night cuz I I try and read before bed and do like a no screens um situation for myself, but you know, I got pulled into this ridiculous plot line that was wild and found myself up to 11:30 and um I my body usually wakes me up around 6:30 most days whether I like it or not. Um, so I was way more tired this morning than I usually am. And today was going to be kind of first half of the day, like doing some writing, doing some editing, maybe doing a video if I was feeling it. But yeah, just being tired. I was like, nah, this this isn't happening today because it's not going to be the kind of quality of thinking or delivery, even if I did a video that I want. And mm. I'm in a position where since it isn't a day job where someone else is minding my tasks and expecting deliveries of things on specific days that I can just push it to tomorrow or next week even. Nothing's going to implode if I if I don't get to it this week. Yeah, I'll I'll do that frequently with with podcasts actually. I, th I find podcasts very difficult to do when I'm super tired. Um so I'll often kick those down if I get a bad night's sleep. Um it sounds like you've really consciously crafted a lot of habits in your life. Like you mentioned um, not having screens before bed, which is something that I really, really struggle with. Like the biggest thing for me is like, I, I kind of consider myself this optimizer persona. You're going to re probably recognize this, right? <laughs> like you read Tim Ferriss, you've probably read some like Dave Asprey, um, you, you buy supplements, like, you know, you've, you've probably like done some ice baths, like just this weird corner of like the tech scene that's super into like biohacking and shit. Like I fall into that a little bit. But the area of my life I've always struggled with is the um, the sleep side. So no phones before bed. That's one thing you mentioned. And meditation in the morning. Is this something, I mean, do you consciously think about this? Like how much do you, um, how much how much thought do you put into these habits? And I guess if you could, you know, illustrate some of the other habits um, that you've got going on as well, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think more and more I'm thinking very consciously about these kinds of habits because they impact my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, how harmonious or not I am with my girlfriend for the day. Like there's, there's lots of things that are directly impacted, I think, by not being conscious of how I'm allocating my mind. And for me, yeah, like days that start with 
a morning walk always, at least all weekdays. Weekends, I give myself some grace and much more flexibility around everything, including being okay with watching some TV in bed at night. Mm. Um, but during weekdays, I try and always start my day with a morning walk when it's still like really crisp and fresh out. And there's just like a really good feeling that I resonate a lot with being in nature um, early in the morning. And then some physical activity doesn't matter necessarily what it is, whether it's a morning run or lifting some weights, doing a yoga class, um, doesn't really matter so much as long as I'm like moving my body, stretching even, and then meditating and journaling. Um, those four things have been like a complete turnaround from what my life was even just a year ago. I would, I would a year ago, like dive straight into work first thing in the morning. And I had this kind of like holy view of the morning hours are your most creative and productive time of day. So it's got to go towards work. And as a result of doing things like therapy and thinking much more about who I am, who I want to be, I realized that I don't want to any longer give my most sacred morning hours to my work. And mm -hmm giving it to myself in the form of meditation, journaling. I like guided meditations, by the way. I, I find it incredibly difficult to sit with a near blank mind for five or 10 minutes. So having someone who's talking me through uh, an activity, mental activity is very, very helpful for me. So tactical questions, which guided meditations and what style of journaling do you do? So I use an app called, oh my God, Simple Habit. Yeah, Simple Habit. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of good instructors on there, but you know, uh, I kind of listen to what type of meditation I need for the day. And it can be something geared around like anxiety, stress. It can be just about having a positive start to the day. There's as a side note, there's some really good, like wind down at night ones too, that I'll occasionally do. Um, but yeah, meditations for a ton of different flavors, but I usually aim for something in like the five to 10 minute range where I can just allow myself to kind of sink into that, like really rooted place, um, of slowing down, not taking myself too seriously, not needing like a perfect day to unfold immediately after I'm done meditating. Um, and yeah, I'll usually journal after meditation when my mind is like most clear and I'm most present and, Journaling for me. Okay. I've gone through lots of different phases, trying things like bullet journaling. Um, but for me right now, at least I've found that just very unrestricted free flow writing about the things that are most present with me, um, tend to be the most fruitful paths towards learning things about myself or uncovering something that Ooh, I need to talk about that with my therapist this week. Things like that usually come up by having a very unstructured journaling session for me. Mm, that's super interesting. So I've I've done journaling on and off throughout the years, but I've finally maintained a habit over the past nine months because of the unstructured approach. I think you give yourself less pressure, and I think you do find more diamonds in the rough too. So I do like a morning pages from the artist's yeah. way, right? It's just three pages, totally just like stream of conscious. And I find some days I'll, you know, be like, oh, I'm tired, blah, blah, blah. Like, I want coffee, like just really banal uh, comments. But some days I'll start with saying that. And then the next sentence goes into something really deep and psychological. And I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> it's crazy how that works. Yeah. Sometimes you'll be like, oh, shit, I really need to expand on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that this was is something I need to dive into. That was for me today was... Uh, as I was doing this meditation, I was like, oh my God, I take myself way too seriously sometimes. And my journaling began as like, oh, I'm tired. Like, you know, I'm ready for a coffee. I usually try and wait and do coffee until after I meditate and journal. Um, and then it launched into much more of that, like deeper stuff of like, man, I really want to unroll what it means to be serious for myself. And, you know, I think there's going to be much more to expand on that, but yeah, like really cool nugget. And this is something really fun. I added that, you know, don't take yourself too seriously to this ongoing getting longer by the day 
um, note that I have in my phone called Ryan's Rules. And it's just things, principles essentially for how I want to be and how I want to live. You mentioned some of those rules. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, number one, I think that's been staying number one for a while is uh, don't romanticize, just live. And that was kind of inspired by my my girlfriend and I reading this article and talking about it together. That was about, I think it's a New York Times article and it's a classic on marriages. Um, and it's about how you are going to marry the wrong person, no matter what you do, essentially. Mm-hmm. And, you know, essentially that every person out there is unique and different. And the person that you choose to be with is best when it's someone that you feel drawn towards. And yeah, sure, you have some things in common. um, But the particularities of the person is just that you can identify with being able to handle the unique suffering that comes along with being with this person, because none Mm. of us are perfect. And you're going to be pissed at each other. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to be sad. You're going to be angry sometimes, but the right person for you, or at least the not overly wrong person for you is someone who you can have like really good disagreement with and like find a healthy place of healing together after these things that honestly are going to happen. And we have such a like romanticized view of relationships and marriage and in our culture these days, that's not helpfully reinforced by Hollywood movies, television books, things like that. And that's been a really big one for me, like just not romanticizing, just being present, being okay with being upset at my partner, but knowing, Hey, that's an opportunity to talk about it and to eventually come closer as a result. I love that. That's awesome. Also, one of my favorite movies of all time is 500 Days of Summer, which really, (laughs) really explores this idea in such a perfect and funny way, in like a meta postmodern way. But it's like, not only do we have these images of perfection with relationships, but we also have like a movie that plays in our heads um, that isn't actually reflective of reality itself. So it's like you you paint these images as to your expectations on the situations. And when, when those go awry, it's like you've got this cognitive dissonance. But I, I feel like that idea, it's obviously pertinent in relationships, but I've also seen it in terms of like business context too. It's like, you're always going to have problems. You're not going to have the perfect day. It's not going to be, um, you know, just raining money on you for no work. And in fact, that maybe like that maybe wouldn't even be fun anyway. So with the way I look at it with relationships and with business is to like pick pick the problems that I'm I guess like pick the problem I'm I'm ready to like work with you know like that's that's what I'm willing to like push through um and instead of like picking this like grandiose vision of like all right here's the perfect business to run or here's the perfect business partner here's the perfect relationship it's like what imperfections am I willing to live with in pursuit of like this this goal together Yes 1000%. And I think like a, a business example of that for me today actually was that with my partner um I decided to remove 45,000-ish subscribers from my list and hmm. I realized that I felt some friction towards doing that and once I spent enough time thinking about it, journaling on it, I just came to this like crystal clear place of like, oh, that's my ego that wants to retain these people that haven't opened an email in nine or 12 months. And the reality is that, you know, 99% of those people will never open an email again because they've moved on. They've gotten what they needed, decided it's not for them, whatever. And it was really my ego that wanted to hold on to having this larger email list, even though those people weren't really there. So That's another thing, like decoupling ego from my business as another great example, not romanticizing the fact, oh, like having 150,000 subscribers makes me feel this amazing, but does having only 105,000 make me feel less good about myself? And the answer was no. Are those the actual numbers? You had 150,000? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. insane. That's Tomorrow a pretty big it'll be 105. <laughs> 105 is still pretty crazy. <laughs> I know, I know. A lot to be like grateful for, and you know, like ideally, 
having more focus on the people who are actually here and present and replying to things and and clicking on my emails gives me the opportunity to learn more about them and find more people like them that can help too. Yeah, that's smart. Um, so with your business, like, was it always a focus to get the email list or like, do you monetize direct on site or like, it, it sounds like the email list has really been a strategy for a long time. I mean, 150,000 subscribers don't come overnight. No, it's, it has definitely been a slow grind. It's been, man, I'd say four to five years of like very consciously list building. And that includes things like pursuing exact keyword phrases that I know would be paired perfectly with like a free course or a free mm. template or some sort of downloadable. And one example of that is blog business plan. So I, I wrote an article about how to create a blog business plan. The five things I think that you should focus on in the early days and kind of tracking your trajectory, how you're doing towards your goals. And that was perfect for a template. And that's just become something that as I do all these things we've been talking about, guest posting, strategic partnerships, um, ways to get more you know, high quality links to my content. I rise up in the search rankings and um, people click on the article, people that want the template, grab it, they join my email list. And yeah, eventually like I'm, I'm monetized more and more starting probably two years ago in a more um, thoughtful way with digital products and primarily courses, a little bit like ebook stuff too, as, as much more like intro products to eventually get someone to join a course, which is like a higher level of engagement for me. What kind of tool, I don't usually go this tactical, but what kind of tools do you use in terms of like how to uh, set those email courses up? Or I, I don't know if it was an email course or, or something different um, or how to capture those leads. Like what, what are you using? Is it like ConvertKit or something like that? Asking me today is very good timing because it's ConvertKit today. Uh, but in a couple of weeks, it's going to be, I think Infusionsoft rebranded as Keep, Keep recently. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be Keep. Um, and that reflects a change that my business partners and I, like really debated for almost a year uh, because I've been so like pro convert kit, but keep allows us to do way more segmenting of buyers. And as my business grows much more into the digital product space, it's just going to be a way more relevant tool for driving more and more revenue from things like digital products. And, you know, I'm not going to forget about on-site affiliate conversions and, um, converting people to affiliate offers via those email courses and from digital products too. But yeah, primarily moving towards digital products and away from ConvertKit as a result. Did the affiliate stuff come first or did the digital products come first? I had a couple of small courses first as more like validation ideas. Um, but if I'm being honest, like I'm not great myself at building all of the different aspects of a course business. I have mm. to have someone who's helping me like choose the right topics for videos, helping me make sure that I don't have like a 20 minute rambling lecture video and that it's more, you know, five to 10 minute focused, actionable, clear steps for people below the video on what they should do. So curriculum management and then selling, like I am not great at selling. Like that's just not a strength of mine. And I, it can sometimes feel a little icky for me to sell. And I I do work really closely with the people that help me write those sales emails and mm -hmm. and help me put together like content for sales webinars and things like that now. Um, but yeah, that's that's something where I have to like really be tapping into the right like authentic voice as far as selling goes. So do you think, I mean, it sounds like the course space, I have a little experience in both of these. I'm trying to do a little affiliate on my own personal site and we built a course for the agency. I, I will say um, it's hard to build up the traffic for the affiliate stuff, but it seems pretty low touch once you've got it. And then the course was really hard to like put together. Like we spent many months and you, like the quality, it's like the content's great, but we didn't have like, you know, professional videographers and like scripts and all that stuff. So I could see that being like, if we really, really like, you know, put all of our effort into V2, it taking a shitload of time. And then like, you think about the launch plan, you think about the sales copy on the landing page, the email drip sequence, the lead magnets, all of that stuff. It sounds frankly, a lot harder than affiliate. Yeah. So I why, think why are you switching to more digital products then? <laughs> 
I think the 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 real answer at the core is that I have people who are now helping me with the course thing that otherwise felt so daunting to do it, you know, quote unquote right. And you know, unrolling the perfectionism a bit here. I think you can do courses that are designed around validating what your more perfect course could look like in the future. And maybe even that validation course still takes you a month to put together and you're just doing loom videos and recording stuff with your iPhone on a tripod with a ring light or something. I think that's, there's something to be said for just shipping a basic course that ideally if you've done your homework and you've validated that people on your email list or people who come to your blog have this real problem that you're working to help them solve with the course, I think that's great. But yeah, now I feel much more like, I guess, confident in the support I have to get something like a script a day from my team and know what to talk about for doing a couple of videos and being able to just knock out a course in a few weeks versus something that I would sometimes like agonize mm-hmm. over for months, be like, oh God, is this even good at the end of it? Um, but yeah, having the the help at all those different stages along the way is giving me the ability to not think about lots of different aspects of it too. So that that's fascinating. For for the course stuff, did you bring on like a business partner at a high level? Are you working with freelancers for some of this and consultants? Or what what does that makeup look like? Earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, I partnered with um, this company called Leverage Creative Group, and Mm -hmm. they essentially function like an agency. Um, And one of their biggest clients is this writer, New York Times bestselling author. His name's Jerry Jenkins, and he's insane. He's written something like 290 books, I think, um, Mm -hmm. nonfiction stuff. But he really fascinating guy who's essentially just a writer. And they approached him and said, Hey, like we want to help you build a teaching business around teaching writing to other people online. And so they've taken this blueprint they created of helping people who are creators primarily, um, build a business around teaching and me as someone who already had some basic courses out there. Like I was just in a great position to, already speak the same language as these people. And so we had a really harmonious start and yeah, the things that they've been most helpful with getting me scripts, um, helping with edit videos, uh, coming up with sales landing pages, writing all of the sales emails and me just being an editor of them is like, man, talk about taking a cognitive burden off my plate. That was that was the biggest thing. And I, I didn't even fully realize it at the time, like going back a couple of years when I was agonizing much more over course launches and finding that I was, you know, something under the surface was pushing course launches back a month and back a month again and again. Um, It was the selling aspect and all these things that can start to feel overwhelming that, that were making me just essentially not want to do that kind of business. And now it feels really good because I'm getting to be the creator and not worry about the stuff that I don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I really resonate with this. I've been thinking about this framework, the who, not how thing, where it's like, who who can I get in to help with these problems? And in terms of like launching a course, I remember we were so overwhelmed, um, not just with like putting it together and like the scripts and the sales pages, but the coordination of it all. So even we just had like a project manager come in and help us with like the launch dates and like what we needed, like at this date and next week and the following week. And just taking that piece off of our plates allowed us the creative freedom to go in and actually record the videos. So I, I'd imagine like anybody who is hoping to build something like this, one, it's it's way more daunting than I would have thought, but two, like there's people who, who, who can help you out. And that's yeah. a revelation for me. And whether you're just doing it yourself or you have someone helping you out, like even with something as simple as coordination, one really big takeaway is to not treat yourself as the productivity robot. Just because Mm -hmm. the space on your calendar is there doesn't mean you're going to feel like showing up and recording two or three videos that day. Maybe that's something that you kick down the road a day or two. Yeah, for sure. So it sounds like the big focus right now um, in terms of where your calories are going is this digital product area, the courses, you're still maintaining the affiliate. I'm sure you're still focused on growing traffic and the overall net here. Do you uh, do you still take on consulting, take on clients ever, or is that totally outside of your world right now? 
it is outside of my world right now. I just, um, I think a month or two ago, I, I ran an experiment on that page I was talking about earlier, the freelance content marketer page. I think it said like $5,000 a month retainer minimum um, for a couple of years. And I changed it a couple of months ago to say $10,000 a month and just see if anyone would hit the contact button there. And just this week, someone from a web hosting company like hit the contact and they're like, hey, let's do this. We're ready. And I was really torn between like, oh my God, like, is this easy, like relatively free money? I've got this team now with my business partners who can probably help with writing the content and help with marketing it. Um, this would be really easy, right? Free money. We all love that. Um, but I allow myself to like sit with that for 24 hours, think about how I wanted to allocate like my time and my energy. And I realized like, yeah, my, my heart wouldn't be in that at all. And me as kind of the, the person, the brand that they reached out to, they would expecting, they would expect me to be involved or they would, Mm -hmm. they would want me to be involved. And maybe there's a conversation to be had about like, Hey, here's my agency work with them if you want. Um, but I think even just having something like that on my mind would be a, an opportunity cost distraction away from all these other things I want to do, like growing the affiliate revenue, growing traffic and yeah, building more digital products. Yeah. I'm glad you said the word opportunity cost. Cause that's, that's what I was thinking. And like, I think people underrate this concept of like mental bandwidth. So I don't want to throw her under the bus. So hopefully this is all right. But our co-founder Ali um, was talking about her past role and how it wasn't difficult per se, like it was actually quite simple, but like just having it on the back of her mind created so much uh, constraint and and just limitation in terms of like what she could think through feasibly for the agency. So when that became no longer an issue and now, you know, she's like working basically full time in the agency, um, it, it wasn't just time that cleared up. It was really just like mental space. And I think it's, it's not, it's not tangible to say like, Oh yeah, it's like five hours a week. Like that's, you know, whatever, but like that five hours a week, like so much more goes into that in terms of like your mental capacity to balance out the other projects in your life. So I think that was a pretty, pretty mature decision on your part. So I've often thought like, all right, I don't want to do this consulting project. I'm going to throw out like a fuck you price and see if they say yes. And then I'll have to do it. But still like, even at that money, it's like, is it worth me taking my eye off the ball in terms of like what I actually want to spend my time doing? Yeah, because ultimately you still have to do that work you agreed to, no matter how much you're getting paid for it. And honestly, I probably would have resented saying mm-hmm. yes to it. And maybe it wouldn't have come up right away. But like, look at it three months down the line. I probably would have been like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. So that was, that was, I think, the right answer for me. Although, man, it can be hard no matter where you're at in your career to turn down opportunities that otherwise feel so right, even though they don't align with the future you see for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strange transition of like early in your career saying yes to all opportunities because you don't know when they're going to come around again to reaching this point on Maslow's hierarchy where it's like, all right, now what do I want to spend my time on? And just, you know, you transition from saying yes to everything to starting to say no to most things uh, because those no's are essentially saying yes to the thing you do want which is a, uh, it sounds like generic self-help book advice, but it's totally true. It is true. And I should say here also uh, for any content marketers listening, if they want some highly qualified leads that are willing to pay absurd amounts for work, uh, shoot me an email. I've got people coming all the time <laughs> <laughs> and I would love to help those that are still in that mode of like, hell yeah, let's do this. We might be able to partner in something. We've got a freelance writer database that we uh, usually send people to if they just want freelancers. So that could be interesting. Love that. Um, We mentioned like part of what you're working on um, just alluded to is growing traffic. Um, That's, that's still a focus. I'm sure. Well be till the day I die. (laughs) How are you approaching that now? Like I'm, I'm sure it's different than when you started, like you've got much more of a, you know, high domain rating website. Now Um, you've already captured a lot of keywords. I, I assume there's a lot of SEO focus on your strategy. Um, can you give me a little peek behind the curtain at how you're thinking about growing that audience right now? Yeah, it's, it's essentially always, I think for me going to be a combination of publishing new content and updating existing 
and promoting just everything site-wide. But if I'm being honest, there's kind of a top five or 10% um, of articles that drive the most traffic and thus get the most promotion attention from me. Um, but looking at my, my upcoming log of content, like there's almost 40 articles in there, virtually all of it about blogging, writing, podcasting, driving traffic, monetizing a website, um, all the topics that I, I've kind of decided to go all in on, at least for the foreseeable future. And we'll see as I change what I you know want to publish about changes too. But yeah, finding that balance, it's never in perfect harmony of like, yeah, I'm killing it on all fronts. I think it's it's a matter of course correction to being the creator, doing some outreach or managing the inbound partnership opportunities that come my way too. Um, and doing things like advising guest post writing. Um, I'll occasionally write some guest posts myself too, if it's for like bigger sites um, that want me specifically to write it. But yeah, that's that's kind of the, the dance I'm walking um, and try and also take my own advice in that promotion should be 80% and creation should be 20%. That's always easier said than done as someone who identifies as a little bit more of a writer first than the marketer, the seller. Um, but yeah, just pushing myself to to really proactively promote my work. All right. A couple of follow-ups. Promotion. What do, you, what do you mean when you say promotion? The vast majority of the time for me, that means guest blogging. Um, mm-hmm. There are other things that fit into the wheelhouse, um, but answering questions on Quora, that's been a really fun one. I, I want to get back to that, but um, it takes so much time for me to write it, like really thoughtful answers on Quora that that won't get downvoted if you link to your blog at the end or something. So you mm-hmm. have to like really overcome a value threshold. Um, you know, that, that probably applies to every platform you're publishing on, but social media a little bit, um, although I haven't been as present. And I think my, my intention with social media these days is to just be present on just like one channel where I know my audience spends time rather than trying to like mechanically send out 10 pens a week and five scheduled tweets and, you know, a clickbait ass LinkedIn status update. Um, so I think to each his own, but focusing on just like a couple of things has always proven to be the best for me. What's your channel? Uh, these days, Twitter the most. Twitter. That makes sense. Yeah. And then also, so guest posting is the primary goal of that to build links to the post that you're um, trying to build links to. Yeah. Yeah. That makes and sense. I think, you know, Google will say day and night nonstop that you shouldn't guest post or. You yeah, but know, it totally, it still works for sure. Oh, it still works. And maybe forever will like, I do not see a day in which Google figures out how to not value content and rank content based on how many links it has. That's just, at least with the way the internet works today, that's the measure of authority and trust is how many other authoritative, trustworthy websites link to this particular article? Yeah, I talked to somebody earlier today who believes that it's no longer, it no longer should be a focus to build links. And I was like, all right, <laughs> objectively, I can tell you that's not true. That's <laughs> it's too just... optimistic. And maybe I'm, I'm being cynical in this, but I just don't see a way in which that's not at least a major component of it moving forward. Totally. And it, at least right now it is for sure. And, you know, if, if it works right now, like you can still build that traffic, which is obviously going to be valuable as you build your audience. So if it works now, why not take advantage of it for sure? Um, so picking the topics, like how do you choose what to write about? How do you prioritize that? And then do you, are you working with freelancers now? You said you're writing a little bit on your, on your own part. Um, so how do you, how do you get the topics written? I think there's there tends to be a couple of different avenues in which I pursue ideas. Um, one, my most favorite, at least, is when I get a reader question that inspires something. And that that's when the article really comes from within. And I try and seize those moments to like just very quickly write an outline as a reply to the email, maybe. Um, so here's my quick answer. And ooh, you really inspired me. I'm going to write an article about this soon. So stay tuned for that. But those are the ones that I often write myself and I don't mm. want to give to another writer because I'm like, ooh, this is going to be so fun. Like this is going to be really authentically me. Um, 
but there's some that is definitely like much more strategic keyword focused, um, taking a look at kind of the, the landscape of what competitors are writing about sometimes too is, is fair game, but I spend a lot of time in Ahrefs, um, mm-hmm. just looking at different keyword ideas that, that either come to me or I find, uh, from content I see out there on competitor websites. Um, but yeah, I think looking at a lot of my best content though, um, it's when it comes from within at least that I feel most proud of those articles. Yeah. So I, I think similarly, I'm going through something with my personal site. Um, so I, I still have a hard time prying myself away from the strategic or not strategic, but like the thought leadership topics that I feel like I'm best suited to write. And it actually took me a long time and uh, a lot of ego dissolution to basically allow <laughs> other people to write on my site. But I'm now hiring freelancers to do things like, like if it's like best email subject lines or best email marketing software, I'm not going to be able to write an article that's much, much better than a freelancer, um, if I'm honest with myself. So I might as well outsource that stuff. Otherwise, there's no potential to scale this thing. Um, so it sounds like you, you've you got a similar split. Like you've got these SEO keywords, um, you partition those out to freelancers, and then you've got like a very like core like reader pain point one, maybe a little more thought leadership And that's the one that you're going to take and spend your time on and really craft uh, to the best of your ability. You just put way more elegant words to what I was trying to describe. Yeah. I, uh, mm. I think there's, you know, the, the 10 best X, Y, Z stuff that is virtually always outsourced to freelance writers. Um, and yeah, like I'll edit those and I usually like proof everything in WordPress to make sure everything like has my voice and I'll, I'll be able to like pull unique things into it before it goes live in a way that feels like I'm still involved in the process, but yeah, like I mean, something like I think we were just working on like twelve e-commerce website builders. That was a freelance written piece because, if I'm being totally honest, off the top of my head, I don't even know if I could name twelve e-commerce. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> it's unlikely you you yeah. went in and actually used twelve of those. But a freelancer can do the research just like you could, and it's like why not outsource that and like actually save the time that you would you would have spent on G two or whatever researching that yeah. stuff. That's it. But on the other hand, like there's something inspired by a reader question, like how did you manage balancing growing, growing your blog while having a full-time job? And so I'm now working on a piece about, you know, side blogging is kind of the working keyword phrase. Um, such a like SEO dude. I always think about articles and keyword phrases, even when they're inspired by interesting things I just personally want to pursue. But that's a really fun one. That's going to be totally, completely written by me because it just feels like it's pulling me to write about it. Yeah, I'm. I'm excited to read that one just personally. Um, who are you chasing? Do you have any like big projects or milestones that you're excited about? It it could be related to the current stuff you're working on. It could be unrelated. It could be way in the future. Like what's what's on the horizon? One thing I've had on my consciousness for a while is writing a book mm-hmm. and I have like delayed and delayed and delayed on this one because I want it to be the right book. I don't want to write like just drop in another thing out there in, in the bucket of like business books or, you know, creator books, blo- blogger books. Um, I'm not interested in just adding unoriginal stuff into a sea of information that already exists. And honestly, there's a lot of great books out there about business, blogging, marketing, whatever. So I'm still waiting for what, what the right book manifests for me. And, um, it's not for lack of opportunity. I had this, um, publisher from this company that's partnered with fast company, um, reach out and want essentially say like, Hey, what do you want to write a book about? We want to do a book with you. And so, that was another example of like difficult to exercise restraint, like, oh shit, this huge opportunity just, you know, knocked my door down. And this is something I've always wanted to do. But I realized after like really sitting with it that I didn't have something yet that I felt extremely compelled to spend what I know would be, you know, six to 12 months working on and then promoting and, and have represent me out there. Yeah. When you do it, you want to do it right. That's amazing that you had the restraint there, especially when it sounds like it has been a dream for you. Um, and you get that opportunity knocking. I'm sure it was pretty tempting. 
side blogging is like one really like maybe potential right there because it it is something I feel so strongly about and have a lot of feelings and experience with. Um, but yeah, I find that I no longer read many business books myself. I mm-hmm. read way more, um, you know, books like Dune, things that are are much more captivating on a deeper level. So I think if I end up doing something related to business, it's going to have a lot more depth to it and be be a lot more about the person that you are in order to create something like a business rather than being like hardcore tactical stuff. Do you feel like uh, your platform, like via blogging, via writing, do you feel like that gives you an avenue or a a sandbox of of sorts to play in to test some of these ideas out for a potential book? Yeah. I think the way in which I would uh, really test this out is uh, run a survey, maybe do something like, you know, I'm going to write this article about side blogging, um, see how many people would be interested in like downloading a PDF version of it or pre-ordering a book that expands on some of the content topics that I cover in, in the article. So I think, I think pre-ordering, that's what I always like to say is like the best measure of viability for anything is are people willing to actually pull out their wallets and vote with purchasing something. So even if it's like a $10 ebook, um, that would be validation in my mind for a topic. Yeah. I love that. Well, this is cool. I mean, we're, we're, we've been talking about a book for a while, uh, me and the agency mm-hmm. founders and similar problem. It's like, what do we write about that doesn't just add noise? It's not just a book for book's sake. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear your thought process here. And I think it's inspiring in, in terms of like how we think about it too. Um, would you, would you be down to do a couple rapid fire questions? Let's do it. Cool. So who do you admire professionally and why? Oh man. You know, it's funny. It it does go in phases. Um, what I'm most interested at the moment usually is reflects back on who I'm listening to the most. I think just off the top of my head, though, James Clear comes to mm. mind first. Um, I got to interview him for my podcast a few years ago. And for someone who has so much going on, is so successful by lots of traditional you know, definitions, he was incredibly present on the 45 minutes that I had with him. And it wasn't like he, it didn't seem like at least, that he was rushing to get somewhere he took his time with answering, like really thoughtful, like someone who's just very like appeared to be very like deeply rooted in himself and his true essence, which comes through so clearly for him. And yeah, that's that's what I admire the most. Yeah, it sounds like you admire presence, if that's the right word, because back to your anecdote on uh Neil Patel and like the different people that walk through the offices of creative live <clears throat> was like, what irked you was it didn't seem like there was kind of a, a presence uh, and an attitude that I wanted to be there, you know, really cared about like the people around me. Um, whereas this is the opposite with James clear. It sounds like. Yeah. Like the ability to just show up, even if it's something that, you know, you didn't necessarily 100% want to do, but you know, except like, Hey, I'm here. I want to have as much, you know, fun in this moment as I possibly can. What are some of the ways in which I can just be here with these people or this person? So even like podcast interviews, like I really enjoy this, man. Like getting to talk one-on-one with someone else who has similar interests and like lives in this same world. Like this is this is the kind of fun that I enjoy having these days. I I lose my sense of time in these, which is exactly what I want to do. And eventually I want to do these in person because I, I actually really resonate with this uh, admiration for presence. uh, Like you're talking about, I find myself at dinners getting really annoyed with people who are constantly checking their phone and like looking behind people's shoulders (laughs) and stuff. It's like, you can sense it. It it makes the situation that's so palpable. And the opposite is, is, well, it's opposite. It's like when somebody's looking you in the eyes and like repeating back what they're, what you're saying, it's like, I don't know. There's something intangible about a person like that and what they can bring to a group setting. So I I really, I feel the same way and I haven't thought about it before. So that's really interesting. Yeah. And also like on that note, which you were just just, just describing right now, like very underrated skill as far as helping you in your career or even in your own business too. the ability to just be very present to 
attune yourself well to listening to others. Um, you know, if you're, if you identify with being kind of a people pleaser, like decoupling yourself from having designs on outcomes for them is a good thing, but being highly attuned to the environments you're in can be a superpower if you allow yourself to exist within your own experience of it. But yeah, just, just be present, like find ways to have fun. Don't take yourself too seriously. These are all mantras for me, clearly. No, totally. It's so much more fun to live life that way too. I also have to say, I I have James Clear's clear habits notebook right here. I use it every day. Um, So good. If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? And would you get every question right? (laughs) <laughs> oh man here we go what i thought i learned in therapy but keep learning every day and i would definitely not get everything right <laughs> <laughs> that's great um you are are you based in socal or where are you at yeah i'm in santa monica now so beach by la do you have a favorite genre of music? Are you into like SoCal, like any of the, the scenes that came up there in the 90s, 2000s? <sighs> I mean, are you asking if I like Offspring? Hell I'm yeah. Ask, yeah, I'm asking if you like the Offspring and ska music. Yeah. Uh-huh, definitely. Revolution, like Gyration, lots of the, or Iration, lots of those guys. So good. But these days, my number one band, favorite music. They just dropped a new song last week, album forthcoming, uh, War on Drugs. Okay, yeah, yeah, I dig them for sure um we'll definitely check that album out what's a talent you would most like to have Hmm. i don't know if it's a talent or a skill i i'd like to think of it as a skill because it's something i'm trying to cultivate but just being present at all times or having a really straightforward path to presence at any point in time I like that. Um, if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? Hmm. Well, right now, actually, very representative of the moment I'm in, uh, Moby. He has, okay. and he has a vegan restaurant in LA, which is making this very realistic. I, my girlfriend's vegan. She's been vegan for a couple of years, and I made the switch earlier this year. So, for me someone that I would just connect with on like a really deep personal level. I think about virtually everything I would imagine. Plus like, you know, I wouldn't say I listen to much of his music anymore, but someone whose music I used to listen to and admire like his personal and professional life so much. See, that's a good answer. A lot of people will answer with something like just a a super famous person or a super crazy person, but you have to think like you're at dinner for a while, like that you're going to have to like (laughs) really optimize for that conversation. (laughs) So it sounds like, Like, what am I going to talk to Richard Branson about for an hour? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Like I, I got to meet him actually at creative life. He was a nice guy, but that was enough. I think for now. Right. Um, so what's a career choice that you considered, but didn't pursue? I really considered strongly sticking with going for like being a CMO of a tech company as like my, my big goal. And I think one thing that really like bubbled up to the surface and I wasn't fully aware of it at the time, but I'm glad I, I ended up doing my own thing was that. I kind of realized that most tech companies are pretty shallow and have pretty cynical views that lead to not caring tremendously deeply about the people in which they spend a ton of money marketing as if they do care about these people. And obviously there are incredible exceptions out there to that, but in the tech space, I became pretty jaded and cynical about how much these companies, you know, even like a huge one like Google, right? Like had a big problem with LGBTQ relations and like that shit really like resonates with me having so many friends who identify as in that group. And I was like considering applying to a a job at Google at the time in marketing. And I was like, ah, I just, I just can't do this. Like that's, that's not me. That's not 
something I want to align myself with. And I guess I wouldn't be totally closed off to joining the right kind of company again someday, because who knows what the future holds in store. But I have a lot higher like evaluation criteria for what I would want to be involved in now. Yeah, that's that's a great answer. Um, won't go into crazy detail, but I, I share your your jadedness and some of this stuff. Um, it's, it's easy to have, especially a large company like that, put like pretty public relations bows on uh, <laughs> that stuff. But yeah, it's it's kind of shocking sometimes when you see the insider how the sausage is made there. Yeah, like the the sponsoring a float during the like San Francisco Pride Parade was such a huge thing. I mean, for tons of tech companies in the city, but for Google in particular, and you know, like they would spend more money marketing and promoting the fact that they were doing this event than actually investing in the real people that they work for, let alone the customers mm-hmm. that they serve. So yeah, that's a huge thing that I take issue with. Totally. What they say versus what they do. Um, oh, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? Overrated virtue. What would be an example of of what you feel virtues are? Well, I think people would say, you know, honesty is virtuous, patience, um, politeness. Um, you know, just think like what what kind of society deems is like appropriate or noble behaviors, right? I think one that I'm I'm very actively working on curbing back for myself is. It, it it boils down to people pleasing. And yeah, maybe we can say that's being polite, mm-hmm. but I think there's a lot of sacrifice of self that goes mm-hmm. on when you want to curate your thoughts, your ideas, your actions to creating what you think is the best experience for another person versus just being unapologetically you. Yeah. So, I mean, we could have another hour long conversation about this, but I I, have been in therapy the last couple of years and follow a lot of these kind of therapy accounts on Instagram and books. And I remember one, I think it was an Instagram post that said like people pleasing is an unconscious form of manipulation. So it's actually incredibly- You were on Instagram yesterday or the day before with that one. Holistic psychologist. (laughs) Holistic psychologist. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And I was like, that's a really interesting point. And I actually see it. So it's it's like you you think you're just being nice to the other people around you, but it's actually this this form of manipulation where you're like, I need them to like me. Um and also like this this goes hand in hand with just boundary setting and how that's good for both parties, right? So I actually I really, really agree with what you said there. And so on that holistic psychologist, they just launched a podcast. So there's a companion podcast episode. It's like episode five. It's like a brand new show for them. But if you if you haven't yet listened to that, oh man, like it, it hits so hard if you identify with being a people pleaser or you know in the past and it's something you're working on trying to like decouple from yourself. Like man, they go real deep on talking about their own kind of you know people pleasing begins as a response to trauma because you learn it's a behavior you learn like. As a kid, at least speaking for myself, there's many different ways you can form that behavior. But for me, it was learning, oh, like in order to receive approval, affection, love, then being really good at reading my dad for me, reading my dad was the way in which I could curate my behavior and my actions towards getting that approval and affection. It's really interesting. And I don't think you can even begin to decouple that behavior in yourself until you open yourself up to looking at and being okay with sitting in the same room as those traumas. Yeah. Well, they say that awareness is the first step. Um, That book Awareness by Anthony DeMello talks a lot about that. I'm kind of frustrated because we, I I thought we had a lot of time, hour and a half, but I I want to talk about this (laughs) for another hour. But um, yeah, we're capped here because yeah, you're you're really opening up an interesting rabbit hole that I've thought a lot about. I'm definitely going to check that podcast out. So thank you for that recommendation. Um, but let's let's wrap up here. Um, do you want to tell the audience, you know, where they can find and follow you online? Yeah, uh, ryrob.com is my home base for everything. R y r o b. It's my nickname. Ha. Um, and most active on Twitter these days. But yeah, that's easiest place to find me. Hell yeah! Well, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you.